But I want to begin today with some great news, some exciting news. We're going to play Jeopardy again. You don't seem all that excited. Well, just two questions, okay? Our category today is Great Betrayals in History. So put that in your mind. Great Betrayals in History. Question number one. He is best known for causing Julius Caesar to utter the words, Et tu, Brute? Who is Brutus? Technically, his name was Marcus Junius Brutus the Younger. Most of you have heard the phrase, et tu brute, and you know, might even know that it means being stabbed in the back by a friend. But here's the basic historical story. Marcus Brutus was a Roman senator, close friend of Roman Emperor Julius Caesar. Brutus was fundamentally opposed to the idea of one man ascending to the status of being a dictator. So in about 44 B.C., uh, he became convinced that's exactly what his friend Julius was aspiring to that he was filled with ambition and wanted to be dictator. So Brutus joined a plot to oust Caesar from power and was manipulated by a few others into stabbing his friend to death in order to protect Rome. And as Caesar died, he said to his friend, et tu, Brute, and you, Brutus, even you, because he was being betrayed by a friend. Question number two. This man lived during the American Revolution and is known as the most famous traitor in American history. Who is? Benedict Arnold, right, Benedict Arnold. See, I didn't even remember his story exactly, but he uh, was a, an American general during that time, was actually a great war hero early in the, in the Revolutionary War, but then he became embittered by what he saw as a lack of respect for his military genius, so he offered to sell military secrets to Great Britain. His plot was discovered, his accomplice was hanged, but he escaped, defected to the British side, ended up living out the rest of his life in England as the most famous traitor in American history. Now you see where I'm going with this. We're in a preaching theme, the story of Jesus all year long. And today we're going to look at an even greater story of betrayal from the life of Christ. We're in a series called Behold the Man, looking at the very last week of Jesus' earthly life. Uh, we began the series a couple of weeks ago and Jeff looked at the authority of Jesus, how it was being questioned by those who resented him, and Jesus expressed his authority. Last week, we looked at what was called the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, when Jesus rode on the back of a donkey to visually present himself as the king, the fulfillment of prophecy. And now, before we read the text for uh, this evening, or today, uh, let me give you a little background. We are now at Thursday of the final week of Jesus' earthly life. So we're just four days after the triumphal entry, which would have happened on the first day of the work week, which was Sunday. Uh, Jesus had just shared the Passover meal with his disciples on this Thursday evening, and several things had happened at that meal. And you're going to hear about these next weekend uh, in the message. First, Jesus changed the meaning of the symbols. When he took the bread, <clears throat> he spoke not of bread made in haste, the unleavened bread, back from the story of the Exodus, but he spoke of his own body that would soon be broken. Uh, when he poured the cup, he didn't speak of the, the cup of God's blessing, but rather of his own blood that would be poured out. And by the way, uh, we have our Holy Week communion services coming up the week before Easter on that Thursday evening and in two services Friday evening. If you've never yet worshipped with us, uh, at one of those communion services, make it a point to be there. It's one of the, the high times of our worship year is celebrating Lord's Supper together in that very unique way. So I hope that we'll, hope that we'll see you there that week. Second, uh, he told them at the dinner that night uh, that one of them was going to betray him. And they all wondered and wondered aloud if it was going to be uh, them. And Peter protested. Uh, and he was the one who would protest. He said, if even if all fall away, Lord, I never will. Jesus then told Peter, before the rooster crows in the morning, you'll deny three times that you even know me. And that Peter being Peter doubled down, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. Now, in all fairness, that evening, that Thursday evening and the Passover meal time had to be a very confusing and, and uh, strange time for the disciples because they had moved in just a few days from the triumph, from the celebration, uh, from Jesus being hailed as king as he came into Jerusalem to an atmosphere of fear. Uh, arrest was, being, was swirling around in the atmosphere. Uh, fear of the Romans, fear of the Jewish leaders. And so there was a, there was a confusing uh, a time for the disciples. They shared that meal in a rented or borrowed upper room, the Bible says, in Jerusalem that's traditionally believed to have been in the southwest corner of the walled city. If you take a look at this little schematic map, uh, the colored area there is the <coughs> walled area of Jerusalem. 
The Temple Mount is up to the upper right. And in the lower left, the far southeast corner, you see the upper room in the house of Caiaphas. So the upper room is where Jesus would have been. It's about a half a mile diagonally from there to uh, the Temple Mount and to then you see the Garden of Gethsemane up to the right. And that's where they're going to head in just a moment. So they're in this rented upper room. Uh, and when they finished the meal, Jesus and the 11 uh, disciples, because Judas had gone on ahead, uh, left the room and walked down a rather steep street toward what was called the Kidron Valley. Now, this street is actually, uh, we had a chance to walk down this last spring when we were in Jerusalem. It's one of the few places in the city where you can know with great certainty you are walking exactly where Jesus would have walked. It's a steep street down from the upper room, downhill, toward uh, the stream that you had to cross to get to the Mount of Olives, uh, and that's called the Kidron Valley. So uh, they crossed over into then what was called Gethsemane, which literally translated means oil press because it was a grove of olive trees. Uh, this picture here was taken, is taken in the region right where they believe Gethsemane would have been 2,000 years ago. This is what olive trees looked like. So it would have been a grove of olive trees. It happened to be one of Jesus' favorite places to pray. And his uh, loyal disciples knew this. Jesus had favorite places where he liked to go to pray. And I don't know if you do that or not, but it's a, it benefits your prayer life to have favorite places you repeat and you go to. And this was one of Jesus' favorite places. So he's praying that evening. Uh, late at night, it's about 2 in the morning. He's praying, he's praying, he's praying. He's agonizing over what's coming because he knows what's coming. The disciples get tired. The Bible says they fall asleep. Then he wakes them up. Let's say it's uh, 2 o'clock in the morning or so. That's all background to Luke chapter 22, and we pick up the story. While he was still speaking, waking them out of their slumber, there came a crowd, and the man called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He drew near to Jesus to kiss him. It was the way you greeted a rabbi. But Jesus said to him, Judas... Would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Now we're going to pause here. This is a famous part of the biblical story. The very name Judas has become synonymous with betrayal itself, every bit as much as Benedict Arnold or uh, a Brutus from uh, the Julius Caesar story. And I think we're often kind of quick to assume Judas was just kind of a, of a bad apple. You know, he was dark and evil and selfish, and he betrayed his friend, the Lord, for a quick payday. And so we sort of write him off as bad apple. And all that may be true, but I want to take a little bit deeper look into Judas just for a couple of minutes. What do we know about Judas? Well, we do know that he was chosen by Jesus himself as one of the 12. So Jesus chose 12 men out of all of humanity to be among his closest followers. Right alongside men like Peter, Andrew, James, and John. In fact, Luke tells us Jesus spent a whole night he prayed all night long the night before he selected his disciples. And sometimes I wonder if he spent most of that evening, most of that seven, eight hours in prayer, praying specifically about the choice of Judas. I wonder. Did Jesus choose him knowing that he would betray him? Did Jesus choose him because he would betray? Or was Judas uh, a genuine follower at the beginning? And then he only gradually fall into temptation and evil and sin. We really don't know the answers to those questions. But we do know that Judas eventually became the keeper of the money bag for their little group. He became their treasurer. And you don't give your money to one that you don't trust. Now, there are two main views of Judas. One is that he was a frustrated zealot. Now, a zealot, uh, zealots were a group of radical Jews who were committed to the, the overthrow of Rome uh, by violent means if necessary. Now, some scholars think that Judas' surname, Iscariot, Judas Iscariot, comes from the word Sicari, which referred to a group of ultraviolet zeal zealots who carried knives or daggers with them all the time because they were ready to kill. Some think that Judas came from that group. That's why he's called Judas Iscariot. Some think Judas was hoping Jesus would be the promised Messiah in the way that King David was king. They would lead them in a triumphant battle and victory over the Romans and perhaps thought Jesus should be using his power and growing popularity to accomplish the political goals of the zealots. Maybe even hope to secure for himself a position of power and influence in the next kingdom. In this theory, Judas became disillusioned with Jesus or frustrated he became impatient and tried to force Jesus hand thinking if I could just get Jesus in front of the powers that be he will declare himself and will use his considerable power and become king and I'll be there along with him 
That's one view. Another view of Jesus is perhaps simpler, and we find it in John's Gospel. I'm going to read this bit to you, John chapter 12. We read six days before the Passover. This is going back to the previous week, right before the triumphal entry. Jesus came to Bethany, the suburb of Jerusalem, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was sitting among those reclining at the table with them. Remember, Jesus had risen Lazarus from the dead. Uh, then Mary took out about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Now, this is the second view. Perhaps a more simple view, simply that Ju Judas loved money. Motivated by simple greed and betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Here's how Matthew tells the story in chapter 26 of his gospel. Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? They counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. So there's the price. The going rate of betrayal, 30 pieces of silver. If you're like me, you wonder, well, how much was that? How much would that be? The consensus is that a silver coin, the silver coins being talked about, were worth about uh, one, was equal to about one day's wages for a laboring man. So therefore, 30 coins on a six-day work week, which they had then, would have been roughly five weeks of pay. So think, in our context, two and a half paychecks. Two and a half paychecks. Not bad, but to betray a friend? That's why I think that Judas might have been up to, up to something kind of in between those two theories. I think Judas, Judas was an opportunist. I think he saw an opportunity here to make a few bucks for himself, at the same time force Jesus to declare himself as king. So he was going for a twofer. That's my personal theory, but we don't know for sure. But there also may have been a deeper significance here. In Zechariah 11, way back in the Old Testament, there's a mysterious passage where the prophet is given 30 pieces of silver, is paid 30 pieces of silver, which was the price of a slave, and God tells him to throw it into the God's house, into the, into the temple. So some see this, 30 pieces of silver, as being the fulfillment of prophecy. So whether or not Judas was a frustrated zealot or just greedy, either way, his failure was to see Jesus as a means to an end, to see Jesus through the lens of his own ambition, his greatest concern was what Jesus could do for him in his career. So he leaves the upper room before the others. He goes and completes his end of the deal by leading the armed guards of the high priest and the Roman soldiers directly to where he knew Jesus would be going to pray because he knew where his master liked to pray, the place they called Gethsemane. Pick it up in uh, verse 49. And when those who were around him saw what would follow... They said, Lord, should we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. Let me pause there. It's interesting that all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, tell this part of the story that one of Jesus' followers took out a sword and won the fight. And by the way, this is one of those little details in the New Testament that is an indicator of the genuineness and authenticity of the story because this is called the test of embarrassment. Because if you were making up this story to make up a new religion about Jesus, you wouldn't write a story. You wouldn't include a detail in the story that embarrasses Jesus. One of, his disciples, one of his followers takes out a weapon and tries to kill the servant of the high priest. That's, the, that's not, not an attractive thing to put in the story. But all four of them have this story. John tells us that the disciple with the sword was Peter, which really shouldn't surprise us. He was the impulsive one. He was the one who boasted he was ready to die for his master. Here's a question I found myself asking. Why did P Peter have a sword in the first place? What's he doing carrying a sword? He's following Jesus around with one of his... Why is he carrying a sword? Well, it's most likely a dagger or kind of a fisherman's knife had it under his cloaks. And the answer is probably um, best that it was just a dangerous time. This, he knew this was dangerous. He knew Je some wanted Jesus dead. He knew some were going to try to arrest Jesus. And he fancied himself as sort of a tough guy, as Jesus' protector. So he was prepared. He takes out the weapon. Now Luke gives us a little more detail here. He says, Peter cut off the man's right ear. 
So imagine that I'm standing in front of Joe, and I want to take out my sword, and I want to stab him right in the face. I'm trying to kill him. But, I, but I, he moves just a little bit, and I hit his, so it indicates maybe Peter was left-handed, because he swings and he hits his right ear, and it means Joe's just quick enough to get his head out of the way when he sees the sword coming. So we, see we have Peter trying to do damage with the sword, and moves, and he just slices off an ear. Verse 51. But Jesus said, no more of this. Other Gospels have Jesus saying, put your sword away. Those who draw the sword will die by the sword. And then he touched his ear and healed him. I want to pause here just for a moment. You see where we are in the story now. This is the beginning of the end. Jesus knows what's going on. There are up to 100 armed men now gathered around him. Swords, clubs, torches, uh, everything. He's got 11 guys with him and one sword. He knows it's over. He's being arrested. This is it. This is the end game. He knows what's at stake. He knows what's coming. And we're told that Malchus, which is the man's name, we find that in one of the other Gospels, is the servant of the high priest Caiaphas, who is Jesus' great enemy. This is the very man who said, it's better that one man die than the whole nation perish. This is the man who will ultimately send him to Pontius Pilate to have him crucified. This is the man who wants Jesus dead. Yet even now, in all the confusion and chaos with the shouting, and as he's being bound like a criminal with chains and ropes, Jesus touches this man and heals his wound. Just as he touched the leper, just as he healed the paralytic, just as he healed the blind man. This is the extraordinary grace of Jesus. He loved, touched, healed, even his enemies. Here's the question. So what happened to this man, Malchus? What happened to him? Wouldn't you think that if you were him, you would have recognized right away something special about this man? Don't you think he would have recognized who Jesus was? Wouldn't you think he'd be overwhelmed with gratitude that he would have fallen on his knees in worship and thanksgiving and gladly followed Jesus anywhere? Isn't that what you would think? Truth is, we don't know what happened to him. He doesn't show up anywhere else. Not in the rest of the New Testament as the early Christian community develops. We see a lot of other names. We see John Mark. We see Luke. We see all the disciples. The apostles become leaders in the church. We see all, a lot of these. A lot of names in the New Testament, but never Malchus. We don't even see him in Christian tradition anywhere. Most commentaries I read assume that this means that even after being healed, Malchus did not follow Jesus did not become part of the early Christian community. He just disappears into history. Even after being so close, even after being touched by Jesus himself, it's possible to refuse him. It's possible to ignore him. Verse 52, Then Jesus said to the chief priests and the officers of the temple and elders who had come out against him, Have you come out against us? Uh, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. Of course, they came in the dark because they didn't want anybody to know they were arresting him. That's why they did it in the middle of the night. Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him to the high priest's house, and Peter was following at a distance. Now I want to look at two things here. First, we'll take a look at the high priest's house, and then I'll come back to Peter. Caiaphas' house or palace was located very near to the site of the upper room. Remember that from the map I showed you? So they would have turned around, led Jesus, this whole mob, back up the very same road he had walked down to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. They walked him back up that same road because Caiaphas' house is almost directly across the street, just a block or so away from where the upper room was. Uh, the comp about a 15-minute walk or so, we actually made that walk when we were in Jerusalem. The compound would have included an office or official quarters where the high priest did his official business. Then there was a courtyard, uh, kind of a, an outdoor area that would have been like a waiting area for family and friends of those being examined or interrogated. Archaeologists have excavated this site uh, that they believe to be Caiaphas Palace, and they found that there are, then there are two levels of, of sort of holding cells for prisoners. The first level was larger, kind of in between Caiaphas' palace at the top and a lower level, but it was in between, lots of room to chain lots of prisoners up so they could be held or they could be interrogated. And then beneath all of that, right at the bottom, there was a small dungeon, a single dark cell carved from rock. And this is looking down into this little carved cell uh, that's now about 20 feet beneath Caiaphas' office. Now, What's you, this is about 10 feet by 10 feet by about 12 feet high. And the interesting thing about this cell, if you look up, there's a hole cut in the ceiling of this cell. And the hole is actually a shaft, 
go to the next slide. Do you have it? That hole is a shaft that goes up through the middle level of holding cells into Caiaphas' main office. Uh, and this is the view from above. If, you look at going, if you're looking going down, if you're standing in Pilate's, where, Pilate, where uh, Caiaphas would have worked, he's looking down through this. So the hole goes right through two stories of the building. Now it's believed that this shaft was used for two purposes. One purpose would have been to lower prisoners through the hole down into the shaft, down into the cell through, through, uh, uh, th through a harness. But the other use of it was to allow the high priest to interrogate a prisoner without the risk of becoming contaminated or defiled by that prisoner. Because there are all sorts of uh, religious rules about cleanliness that the high priest had to follow. And this was close to Passover, so he's already gone through all his cleansing rituals. And if he accidentally touches or comes into contact with a prisoner who's been guilty of a capital offense, it makes him defiled. He has to go through everything again. It takes him a whole week to, to cleanse himself again. So they put the prisoners in the tank, in the hole, and he spoke to them through the shaft until he was sure they were not going to defile him. Then they, they were lifted up, and he could interrogate them personally. So I want you to think about this for a moment. Caiaphas is a man with murder in his heart. He's behind the plot to kill Jesus. And he is questioning Jesus through this shaft, and he's questioning Jesus, who is the one without sin. It's backwards. We had a chance to climb down into that cell when we were in Jerusalem. It's dark. It's, it's cold. It's just carved out of stone. And you stand in that cell, and you look up, and you see this shaft. And it goes up to where you were being questioned. It's an overwhelming thought to be standing there and realize you have about 98% certainty that the Lord stood right there by himself, alone in the dark, allowing himself to be questioned by the man who wanted his life. And he stood there in my place and in your place. An overwhelming thing. I wanted you to see those pictures. Secondly, I want to look at Peter. It says, Peter followed at a distance. Now this makes sense because he's just cut off the ear of the servant of the high priest. Uh, he had the fear of retribution. He was in trouble. That's a crime. So it's to Peter's credit that he even followed that closely along, follows the crowd back up the street all the way when all the others would have scattered in fear. But there's something very human to me, very catching in that phrase, followed at a distance. Because following at a distance is really not a good place to be. Verse 55. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. So picture the scene. It's middle of the night. It's maybe now three in the morning or so. Uh, it's getting toward daylight. Crowds gathered in the dark courtyard. Uh, Peter's uh, followed the crowd. He feels somewhat safe because it's dark. So he's sort of hanging on the fringes of things. He knows Jesus is being interrogated. He might be able to see into where that's happening. And someone kindles a fire. The word used is charcoal fire. And the only other place in the New Testament where that same word is used is when Jesus later, after the resurrection, kindles a charcoal fire to cook, cook fish for his disciples. And it's around that fire he asks Peter three times, do you love me? It's a beautiful poetic book ending of this story. Verse 56, then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light of the fire and looking at him closely, said, this man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, woman, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them. But Peter said, man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, certainly this man was also with him, for he too is a Galilean. What he's referring to there is the Galilean accent, which we obviously can't hear because we read the story in English, but Peter had a northern accent, which was seen as sort of a hillbilly country accent, and all the Jews in Jerusalem could recognize it because it was the same uh, dialect that Jesus spoke with. But Peter said, verse 60, Man, I do not know what you're talking about. And immediately, while, it was still, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Now, it's possible here for Jesus to make eye contact with Peter because this is not a big area. It's probably not as far across as this room is where the palace was and the courtyard was. Um, and it could have been open. There could have been a line of sight. Or Jesus was being moved, uh, getting ready to be sent to the next part of his interrogation that evening. Either way, Jesus looks at him, and they make eye contact. Luke says, then, And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. So Peter had promised to stand up for Jesus. He had boasted he was ready to die with his Lord. He would even taken out his sword, and to prove it, he was ready to fight, ready to die. And now he has three opportunities. 
sitting around a fire to acknowledge that he was a friend of Jesus and all three times he fails. Why? Because he followed at a distance. He followed at a distance. He followed, but he tried to blend in with the crowd. He followed, but he tried not to be recognized. He followed, but he tried not to be identified with Jesus. He had seen what happened to those who ran afoul of the Romans. He had seen the streets of Jerusalem lined with crucified men. He feared being identified with Jesus. He feared being found out as a disciple. He feared the mistreatment that may have followed. And so I wonder if you've ever felt something like that, even in a minor way. Now, there are places in the world today where being identified as a follower of Jesus can cost you your life. There are plenty of those places today in the world. Now, in our culture, we aren't in that kind of danger, at least not now. But we do face other kinds of issues. Maybe we face more ridicule or more funny looks or more um, condescension from our family or from peers or from your boss. They say, how can you believe in that fairy tale? You're, you're a Christian? You're one of those people? Bible thumper? Jesus was just another religious teacher like Muhammad or Buddha or nothing more. How can you Christians believe he's more true than anybody else? Christianity is nothing more than a crutch for weak people who need something to depend on. We want to follow Jesus, but we worry about what others are going to think of us. We worry about what they're going to say. So we follow sometimes at a distance. So, now it's time to find ourselves in the story. As we've gone through the story of Jesus, I tell you over and over again that as you read through the New Testament, and you read through the stories, they're there for a reason. And they're there so that we can find ourselves in the story. It's a living story. It's a human story. So we have Judas, who is the betrayer, who wants to follow Jesus so long as it serves his agenda, his ambition. We can find ourselves in Judas as the betrayer, the one whose personal agenda is more important than Jesus' agenda. Have we betrayed him for another savior? Money, work, success, career. A lot of things can fit that that spot in our lives. Or there's Peter. He's the denier, trying to follow at a distance. Do we worry more about what other people think? Or do we worry more about what Jesus thinks? Are we Peter? And then there's Caiaphas. I call him the questioner. He's questioning Jesus, and it should be the other way around. Are we putting Jesus on trial, demanding that he answer our questions for our benefit, to prove who he is? Or do we put ourselves in a position to answer his question, which is, who do you say that I am? And then there's Malchus, this this mysterious character in the story. So close, even felt the touch of Jesus, the healing of Jesus, yet, for all we know, failed to respond. And finally, we have to look at the character Jesus, betrayed by a friend for a couple of paychecks. Betrayed by a friend for a couple of paychecks. Denied by one of his closest disciples three times that he even knew him willing to heal the servant of his greatest earthly enemy, allowed himself to be thrown into a dungeon and held there in our place. This is Jesus, the one who loves the betrayer. If Judas only knew, the one who loves the betrayer, the one who forgives the denier. Peter hung around long enough to find that out. The one who heals, one who never responded He healed the one who didn't respond. He died for the one who wanted him dead, who took our place in that dungeon. This is Jesus in the story. And the question is, are you willing to follow him? Closely? Or at a distance? Or at all? Would you bow with me as I close in prayer? Lord Jesus, we thank you for this story. And it's not just an ancient Bible story. Keep us from seeing it like that and reading it just like a a flannel graph. It's not an ancient Bible story. It's a real story. It's a human story. It's a story of greed and fear and failure and hatred. It's a story of forgiveness and love. And we are all, each one, in the story somewhere. For we too 
sometimes betray. We too sometimes deny. We too question. We too ignore. But you never stop loving. You never stop forgiving. You never stop healing. Help us to follow. And not at a distance, but closer and closer, nearer and nearer to you who loves us so. It's in your name that I pray. Amen.